So uh, I'm going to talk to you today about truly immersive AR, a uh, novel path to fully realized AR glasses. Uh, you heard the introduction already from Andy. I'm Nikhil Balram. Uh, we, uh, Iway Vision is a startup headquartered in Israel with a US subsidiary based in Silicon Valley, which I'm the CEO of. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, talk about the company in, my, in more detail. I invite you to go check out the website uh, to learn more about us. Okay, so uh, I want to start by reminding you of a grand vision of, for AR glasses that is shared by many of us. Uh, and that's a vision of a future device, which on one hand is, uh, provides an extraordinary experience. It's truly immersive in terms of giving you natural resolution for the eye, large field of view, continuously wearing focus so that the digital looks as real as the real. Uh, on the other hand, something that's incredibly usable, it has a form factor close to my glasses, uh, it's uh, bright enough that you can use it anywhere, outdoors, in, you know, bright moon, uh, daylight, and that's efficient enough that it actually lasts all day. Uh, the reality is that it's extremely challenging to build something like that, in particular to achieve all those things at the same time. There's some fundamental system trade-offs for AR glasses. Uh, the most fundamental trade-offs lie in performance versus form factor. So we created this diagram which shows a segmentation of the market from the perspective of these two fundamental attributes. Uh, on the y-axis, I have performance, which in the case of AR glasses uh, is measured in level of immersion. So you start with something that's very uh, basic, uh, heads-up display, it's like a smartwatch on your face. Uh, the next step up is you have a TV on your head. Uh, the next step up is you have, you know, the TVs on the wall. You have some notion of space. Uh, and then you get to full immersion where you have the dynamic range, the resolution, the color gamuts, and the wide field of view so you can be fully immersed. And then the last step above that is that when you have this fully immersive experience, you want to be able to interact with it. And that means... Uh, needing to be able to change to vary the focal plane of the digital content, just like the real world. Um, the x-axis is uh, fairly obvious. You start from head-mounted displays and you get progressively better form factor till you get to the eyeglasses that, that I'm wearing. Uh, when we look at the space, we see basically people taking one of two paths. Uh, the first path, which you can think of it as the informative AR path, is basically hugging the x-axis sacrificing performance and focusing on getting as far along that axis as possible to look like glasses. Uh, the path that most companies have followed is uh, that somewhere in the middle uh, where you try to find a balance between form factor and function. Uh, and in my opinion, that's a very hard thing to do in early stage market like this. Now we think that there's a third path, that there's this big open space we call truly immersive AR. And then there is a path there for a series of products that deliver an extraordinary experience for episodic use for some specific purpose on the way to that upper right corner, that vision uh, of the fully realized AR glasses. So um, as we did push deeper into understanding this, that opportunity and that path, um, we've come to believe that truly immersive AR and a comfortable and elegant form factor uh, which can give you 10x better visual experiences can disrupt large markets. And just talking, uh, giving you a few examples from my experience, uh, in cinematic and theme park uh, with, you know, with COVID having uh, made most people leery of venturing out of the home, uh, the kind of experiences that need to be provided in next generation cinema and theme park need to be significantly better than what's available today in one phone. In the case of home entertainment and gaming, uh, we think that immersive AR provides a much better experience than you get today with high performance monitors. And it, uh, it addresses the, some of the deficiencies that VR uh, has in the context of gaming, uh, things like social isolation. Uh, mobile entertainment gaming, we already heard a little bit about uh, Niantic and Pokemon Go. So in that example, um, you know, you imagine today on a post-COVID world, 20,000 people gathering in a beautiful scenic outdoor location or park, 
so that they can enjoy chasing or capturing digital assets together among this amazing natural scenery. But today that experience is you look at the world through this tiny window, the phone that you're running around holding in your hand. Uh, it's much easier to imagine what a compelling experience that could be if you put on your immersive AR glasses and you had a hands-free experience enjoying both the digital and the real. Uh, the, the last example I'll give you is one that we're seeing a lot of traction in, is in e-learning. Um, this idea of e-learning or remote learning was already uh, scaling in a very significant way even before COVID. Uh, and of course, COVID made all learners into e-learners or remote learners. And here, this is uh, the idea that if you're a working professional and you want to upskill yourself, we all understand that we are now need to be thinking about lifelong learning. And so you sign up for certifications or programs or master or graduate programs, and you do this uh, yourself online. Uh, the, the big pain point in that is uh, boredom or engagement. Uh, it's really difficult to spend a whole day sitting and staring at a screen and then do the same thing again in the evening. So we think that AR enhanced e-learning could be a very significant disruptor in this market. So we talked about the opportunities if you provide a really extraordinary experience. Uh, now, but we wanna take this experience all the way to that upper right corner. And the key to doing that is efficiency, uh, energy efficiency, which is always the the critical element in mobile electronics. So we need an approach that minimizes power in terms of photons, flops, megabits per seconds, while maximizing experience in terms of resolution, field of view, dynamic range, and range of focus. So how do we achieve this much greater efficiency? In the traditional approach to AR, uh, you have uh, a fundamental constraint uh, that you have to deal with called the Lagrange invariant. And what this says is that that the field of view finds the eye box. The eye box is this area, the volume or place where you can see the image when you put on the glasses or headset, that the product of the field of view times the eye box is bounded by the size of the display. Now in VR, this is not a problem because you make a gigantic display, but in AR where the display is a small uh, uh, element or off to the side, this is a fundamental constraint. And so the way people have addressed this is this idea, it's called exit pupil expansion, or exit pupil replication. And so you, you inject light into this waveguide and then you, you, you dribble it across a big area around the eye. So you end up with creating this big volume of li light uh, uh, on the face so that your eyes can see the image no matter where they are, how close they are or where the system is sitting. Uh, and so this works from the fit perspective, but there are some fundamental challenges it produces, uh, the loss of brightness, you end up getting a much lower brightness image because most of the light is wasted. And so you have to use heavy tinting uh, to if you want to use it outdoors, which destroys the sense of immersion. Uh, there is a problem with efficiency. Again, you're wasting most of the light. And then you have a cosmetic challenge because people looking at you can see this light flooding your face. So the alternate approach that Iway came up with was this idea that you start with a small exit pupil because you have a small image source. And then instead of expanding it, you move it in perfect synchrony with the eye so that you deliver that image only along the visual axis of the eye, which gives you, uh, which allows you to have a very bright image with very little power and very great efficiency. So here's an example. Uh, Matthew talked about uh, the write-up that Carl Gutak did, uh, you know, the famous tech blogger uh, visited us. We let him take pictures, open up the system, take a close look at the system. And so this is from his blog, examples of a real comparison. So on the left side is a photograph of someone wearing one of our prototypes. And you can see a tiny uh, amount of light going into the eye, exactly where the eye is looking. On the right side, you see a classical approach. This is uh, a diffractive waveguide from wave optics, where you can see exactly what I was talking about earlier, where you flood that whole area with light. Uh, and so you, you can see the fundamental differences in terms of brightness, efficiency, and cosmetics. Okay, so basically we're saying this idea of moving a small exit pupil is the key to making a really efficient system, a really high quality efficient system. So how do you do it? Uh, three critical elements. You do direct retinal projection, low power lasers, projecting a single pixel at a time through highly efficient reflective optics. 
tightly coupled with eye tracking that move that image with the eye. And then if you can do these two things, you get this extraordinary efficiency uh, to, uh, through something called foveated projection. And this is ba basic tutorial on human visual system is that uh, if you look at our retina, a very small portion of the retina called the fovea is the only area where we have full resolution or 2020 uh, resolution. It's about the size of uh, the thumb when I hold my hand out. So about a few degrees of arc. And uh, the rest of the eye has rapidly declining density of receptors, so very low resolution. So the reason, the, the reason that the world looks, uh, the entire world looks in high resolution when I look out at, around me is because the eye is constantly moving. So we are building at any given time, building this high resolution percept in our brain. And now in, in our AR system, if you know where the eye is looking at all times, you know where the visual axis centered in the phobia is, you can deliver a small high resolution image just to that small area and a low resolution image to the rest of the eye, which gives you tremendous efficiencies. So here's an, an actual example. So on the left side is what you perceive. You see a continuous stone, high dynamic range, retinal resolution image, uh, which over an 80 degree field of view would require, normally require a 5K by 4K display or 20 million pixels. Uh, I've actually built one of those displays at Google to do exactly this. On the right side is what we do, which is we do an SVGA image uh, that moves with the eye. And so you have retinal resolution in just that circle. And then you have an SVGA image across the rest of the field of view. So you achieve through 1 million pixels, two SVGA images, you can achieve the same visual quality as 20 megapixels in a conventional approach. Okay, so very quickly looking at a static image, uh, so if you add up all the things that you can get as a result, so because it's a highly efficient approach, you can get very high brightness to the eye. So in our demo, that dragon fires 20,000 nits. You can show this entire scene in bright daylight. Uh, you have, because you can dim the image, you can have very high dynamic range, you can go down to 0.1 nits. And so because of the high dynamic range, you get this appearance of solidity. You get so-called uh, hard AR where that rock actually looks completely solid. Uh, we already talked about the retinal resolution. Um, because we know where you're looking, we can modulate the beam and change the focus dynamically from 20 centimeters to infinity. So in this example, when you're looking at the physical game board with the digital rock, both the physical game board and the rock can be in focus together. So uh, just in the last minute or two, to pivot and talk about go-to-market strategy and product, um, we're taking a pragmatic approach in open ecosystem, which is basically strategic partnerships with everybody in this space. Uh, in the diagram on the right side, you see in green, the target markets. So those are enterprise applications and entertainment applications. Um, you see uh, other segments like platform. Platform is, for example, Adobe, uh, Creative Cloud, or the online learning platform Upgrad that we partnered with. Uh, OEMs are folks like Samsung, who's an investor. Carriers are folks like Verizon, who's also an investor. Uh, component makers are people like ST Micro, Osram, et cetera. You know, we joined the Lazar Alliance and are working closely with these folks. Uh, basically, what we are developing a series of reference designs or platforms that an OEM can license and take to market under their own brand. Uh, we're also building our own systems for specific vertical applications like content development or e-learning. You know, if you sign up for a master's degree, AR enhanced learning, you care about the name of the university on the certificate, not the, the logo on the equipment. So first product concept, you can think of it as the world's best, the most best immersive AR headset. Uh, something that's comfortable and elegant form factor, but not something that you're going to be walking down the street wearing, which can use both local or cloud compute. So local from your phone or laptop or through the cloud uh, with an SDK that connects to all major content creation platforms. So for example, that Dragon demo, which is a real demo you can come and see, uh, was created in Unity uh, with one camera creating the foveal image over a 10 degree field of view and another camera creating that, that peripheral image. Um, so last slide, just ending with a call to action. Uh, if you're a potential investor, strategic partner, you know, contact us, happy to discuss, see demos, uh, which are available in San Jose and Israel. Um, 
Thank you for your attention.